kicking off the afternoon of the general industry, we're going to do one of our very few 60-minute sessions. Um, so as the, over the course of the last couple of years, we've been moving towards shorter and shorter lecture sessions, mainly because you, our audience, have told us that you would like to hear shorter sessions and, and more of them. Um, but when we have a panel, we have a large uh, topic such as publishing that we want to get a bunch of different perspectives on. We often will organize an, an hour-long session with a number of panelists, and that's what this is. So with the advent of app stores and the rise in popularity of app stores as a, as a distribution mechanism and free-to-play games as a, as, a, as a rising in popularity form of, of monetization, a mechanic for monetization games, one of the things that has dramatically changed in the game business is the role of what publishers are. Game publishers had remained unchanged largely for a pretty long period of time, going back into the late 80s and early 90s. Um, even with the, uh, the start of digital distribution and casual games, the role of the publisher didn't change very much. Um, but we've had a real struggle over the last couple of years uh, with the change in power structure between developers and publishers. No longer was it possible for a publisher to pay a developer to build something over nine months and then never talk to them again because you have this ongoing commitment that you have to make to these service-based games. So as part of an ongoing effort to try to quantify, re-quantify the roles of publishers in the industry, Jeff Hilbert from DDM agreed to put together a panel of publishers to talk about the changing roles of publishers in the industry. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and he can introduce this panel and his panelists. Thanks for the introduction. Um, just so you know, we, we like to get a lot of questions from the audience about things that you guys want to know directly. So I have a few questions prepared, but if you guys have any direct questions, feel free to jump in. Um, so the way, the way I'd like to do this, I'm going to introduce the panelists. They're going to tell you about their company, what they feel they do as a publisher, and roughly if you were to submit a product to them, what they look for and what you guys can expect in return. Um, just a quick background on me. Um, I own DDM. It's an agency. We represent video game development studios. So we work with a lot of the publishers, and we see a lot of different models. So we do everything from self-publishing to distribution. Uh, we have offices all over, so we just work with a lot of different publishers, so we have a different perspective. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Paul from Big Fish, because he's in the middle. Introduce myself. Yeah. Is that one? So I'm Paul from Big Fish Games. I've been in this industry a very, very long time. I'm very, very old. <laughs> uh, Big Fish has evolved over the last 11 and a half years. We started as a studio and morphed into a publishing and distribution company around premium casual games, games you buy, and now are expanding that kind of competency in our customer reach and everything we do and our producers into free to play, um, focused on more breadth than we were in premium. That uh, premium became kind of a one, one trick pony, one type of genre. With free to play, each game is a P&L, and so we are looking to expand pretty broadly what the definition of casual means for us. Okay, thanks. Um, Vlad. Меня зовут Влад Суглобов. Я представляю компанию G5 Entertainment. Мы, как и остальные здесь, наверное, начали тоже как разработчики достаточно давно. Разработчики игр для мобильных платформ, и затем в 2009 году мы стали издателями. Сначала собственных игр, затем игр других разработчиков. Тоже фокусируясь только на мобильных платформах. В 2011 году мы выпустили свою первую free-to-play игру, которая очень неплохо пошла. Затем мы выпустили еще несколько. И сейчас сфера наших интересов — это в основном free-to-play, casual жанры и премиум игры тоже, но основной фокус на free-to-play. Соответственно, мы ищем проекты достаточно оригинальные, качественные, а самое главное студии, мотивированные на достижение успеха совместно с нами на этом рынке. Окей. Кай из Геймвилл. Я Кью Ли, президент Геймвилл USA. Uh, Gainville is a publicly listed company in South Korea. Uh, we have branch offices in the U.S., uh, Japan, and China. Uh, we've been actively working with a lot of developers around the world. Uh, I think the count was around 70. Uh, and we've been doing mobile games uh, since the year 2000. Uh, we strongly emphasize 
on the role, uh, on the operation role of the pub publisher. And uh, yes, uh, I think, and we could also help uh, a lot on the distribution side too. Okay, and then Dan from Spiel Games. Yeah, um, Dan Prig from Spiel Games. Uh, I've been there you know, about six months, and uh, prior to that, I was at uh, Unity and GameStop, and and a long time ago, working with Paul at uh, Real Networks Game House. Um, at Spiel Games, uh, we're focused on advertising uh, through uh, in-game and, 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 and whatnot, and uh, we do a lot of web games. We've got about 180 million monthly users across all of our networks, uh, as we're fairly global, uh, and been around quite a while. Um, and I think uh, for us, uh, the long-term view is is uh, in terms of the free-to-play model is to focus more on the advertising aspect of it, uh, as, it as an additional and uh, newer opportunity for a lot of developers out there. What, what kind of split are you seeing in advertising versus uh, paid? What kind of revenue split are you starting to see? Uh, you mean versus? Yeah. What, I mean, what, we're, what? we're totally advertising based. So totally, there's totally no. We don't do any kind of a premium or subscription base. It's completely off the advertisers. Uh, we're seeing a big growth in uh, video um, in terms of eCPMs and, and whatnot. And so <laughs> it, it's definitely driving a lot more. And I think for us, it plays better into the free-to-play model as, as consumers are used to the free content. And so we're simply just monetizing it like you would in TV uh, in terms of that model. And if you can answer this, what could somebody expect in revenue from your company? If they brought a game to you, if they brought a game to you, roughly how is a deal with you guys structured? Um, for us, it's more about, um, it's probably like a, a longer kind of revenue stream. So you won't see like a big, you know, free to play model in terms of millions uh, for a particular game. Okay. But you might see, you know, a nice monthly income in the thousands. Um, and then if you, and again, you, you know, these games are developed in a much shorter time frame. So, okay. so you're, if you're spending 30 days to three months to make a web game and you can build five or six web games, that's incremental stacked on top of each other that can, you know, support studios for, for years. So we're seeing good, you know, 12 to 20, 24 month monetization because people just play these and we monetize that way. Okay, and then as far as mobile goes, I mean, this is the big question that we always have with all the developers. If I can self-publish on the App Store, why do I need a publisher? What, is the, what do you guys feel is your key strengths that you guys bring to the table? I'm, I'm sorry for speaking Russian. Как мне кажется, основная необходимость в издателе. Знаете, много лет назад, когда игры продавались в коробках, да, в магазинах, издатель нужен был, чтобы произвести коробки и довести их до магазинов. Сейчас роль, очевидно, поменялась, потому что цифровая дистрибуция всю эту суету с коробками убрала. Но осталось все равно... Остался большой объем работы, рутины, большой объем работы по продвижению продукта, который не является креативным, интересным процессом, который интересен разработчикам изначально. И издатель, он как раз аккумулирует в себе знания, как вывести продукт, как донести его, как его монетизировать, как правильно развивать его после релиза, каких ошибок не совершить в процессе разработки и после. Вот, собственно, роль издателя сейчас, она сместилась в сторону как бы совместной разработки с разработчиком, если хотите. То есть издатель гораздо больше сейчас погружен в разработку, чем ранее. Это далеко не только дистрибуция. Издатель как дистрибутор, ну, по сути, на мобайл, на цифровых платформах эта роль, она не нужна никому, я думаю. Чувака. Well, I totally disagree. <laughs> what, what, what he said. I have no idea to comment on that. <laughs> um, so I might repeat exactly what he said. I have no idea. Um, you know, the role of the publisher is there's many aspects, and it really depends on what the developer and what the type of game is. Um, we get involved in everything from the creative side on the GDD forward. We see a lot of games go through our systems. We know what customers are demanding and what is kind of waning as far as popularity in games and game genres. Um, I would also say that you know self-publishing is great um, and all three people that find your game will enjoy it. Um, Apple, for example, launches up to a thousand apps a day on peak days now. And Apple's great at promoting a couple games a week, but that's about it. 
Um, what we do is we try and understand what our customers are asking for and making sure that we are working with developers to bring them type of games that they want. So when we launch it, uh, we can get very broad distribution and discovery. So it comes down to kind of collaboration on the build process, discovery of the apps, and then we assign uh, data analysts and producers throughout the iteration process in the months to come to help the developer tune the game to really achieve what we're trying to trying to do with the game in the market. And when appropriate, uh, we have a very large checkbook to, to promote the game if that's appropriate for the game. Uh, as far as promoting the game, how do you guys, how do you guys go about promoting it? What are, what are some best campaigns that you use? Well, we have, a, you know, we have 10 years of building an audience for casual, and much of that audience is now cross-platform. Yep. And so we have a tremendous organic reach where we can actually push a game into the top 20 uh, free titles. And if the game warrants it, we can augment that with ad spend and, and, and push it into the top 10. Um, for key game launches, we can push a game into the number one free spot. And that is on the distribution side. And that's very important initially to get discovered for data, but also on an ongoing basis that as you improve the game, you want new people coming in to give you more data on how the game has improved or has not, uh, to continue making, Im making weekly improvements until the game is a, su is a success, or uh, both the publisher and the developer jointly decide that it's time to move on to a different game, um, which is the case in a hit-driven industry. Okay, so you provide ongoing support as well. With yeah, absolutely. analytics and things like that. Dan, can you do it? Can you add a point? Okay. Yeah, so, so for us, we have a, um, a slightly different angle. Of course, we, p we have a large user base of about 300 million uh, users, but um, I don't think uh, it's really the dis distribution uh, that the developers need uh, because you could always buy traffic if you have the money, and there's a, a lot of good ad aggregators out there too so it's not like you have to work with 200 channels or uh, to do to advertise for your game um, so you could just simply use those med mediation layers uh, I think uh, the biggest difference is in the past uh, when you were launching games on the App Store most of them were uh, most of the games were looked at as a product where now I feel like uh, all of the games that are successful are more like a, a live service so um, I think that concept is missing from most of the developers that I talk with, and uh, the live operation part is uh, the biggest part that we uh, emphasize on. Um, we hired a lot of uh, former online PC uh, people who, who worked for like bigger online PC gaming companies, and they bring in um, about 10 years uh, of 10 years database of uh, live, live operations uh, on the PC. And those same rules are being adopted to the mobile space. And I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we helped getting developers uh, getting featured in the past, and we thought that was our role. But now I think the role has been changed to providing live operation services uh, for the developers that we work with. Okay. We're actually doing some deals with them, so <laughs> we're seeing that. No, it, it's been pretty good. They, a lot of publishers say they're going to pr provide support. You guys have been good so far. Dan? Yeah, I think, um, God, you know, been in this industry a long time now and, and watched the uh, evolution of a, a traditional publisher. I think for the first time, I think we're seeing more independents uh, than their actual traditional studios uh, than ever before. So I think uh, the traditional role of a publisher uh, has to evolve in terms of um, a long-term partnership. So I think philosophically what you, know, uh, what you want to look for in a, in a publisher is someone who kind of, I think, has uh, the things that you don't have in terms of a, a small independent developer. And, and yes, it, you know, part of that's reach, part of that's marketing, um, but part of that's also you know, uh, understanding you, know, uh, you as a small independent developer you know, uh, what you're capable of and, and where it actually put you in the marketplace. Um, right now there's, there's, you know, as Paul said, there's so much content out there. Um, it's gonna be more about those partnerships with a publisher that make more sense and you're gonna see a lot more of uh, in the future because I think it's, you know, uh, you know even us uh, players up here, you know, we l are looking for partnerships with, you know, the big and small because we recognize that this pond is huge uh, in terms of uh, and, you know, we're competing not only with games, but you compete with, you know, the Netflixes, and you can compete with, 
you know, e-books and the readers and, and all the technology, and you have one consumer who's only got a limited amount of time. So I think, you know, looking at, you know, your brand itself and saying, are there other things we can do than, than pure distribution? And yeah, looking at uh, your game as, as a service and say, you know, we're in this for the long haul. I think, you know, when you guys look for publishers, you know, I think there's, these are legitimate questions you should be asking and demanding from, from people that you work with in terms of that partnership. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many people in here have self-published their own titles? A few. How many, of you got, how many people have worked with publishers to publish a title? About the same amount. You know, that, that's a good mix. You know, one of the things we always look for in the publisher, too, and you guys nail it, it Yes, you want distribution. Yes, you want them to feed users. But it's the analytics and the analysis before we go live. That's one of the biggest things we see is as a developer, you get too close to the game. And you and your friends all like it and play it. But then all of a sudden, you bring it to a publisher, and a fresh set of eyes come on it. And the coaching that we get, even before we go into beta, just moving little things, that's probably some of the most valuable stuff that we end up seeing, besides the money and the distribution. Don't get me wrong. We appreciate all that. Um, which is my next question, during beta. Uh, during, a beta during beta phase, assuming, assuming you guys have the game, and you're, what, kind, what kind of feedback do you f uh, provide to the developer? Oh, sir. Ну, uh, мы начинаем обычно гораздо раньше, чем с бета-версии, и уже начиная с самых ранних стадий, мы предоставляем достаточно много рекомендаций. А на этапе бета, естественно, мы подключаем локализации, quality assurance, а мы проводим большое количество фокус-тестов, которые мы начинаем обычно раньше. Соответственно, к бета-стадии мы приходим уже с игрой, которая достаточным образом отполирована на живых пользователях. И после запуска игры самая важная стадия, которая наступает, это некий тестовый трафик, который мы запускаем на игру и смотрим на, на аналитику, смотрим на поведение пользователей, сходится ли у нас ожидаемое от игры с тем, что имеет место на самом деле быть. Нужны ли какие-то изменения в игру, нужно ли что-то переделывать, менять баланс и так далее. И, собственно, с этого этапа команда наша и команда разработчика уже переходит в плотное сотрудничество по регулярным апдейтам. Соответственно, с предоставлением с нашей стороны аналитики, рекомендаций, ну и кнута с пряником, соответственно, чтобы апдейты выходили вовремя и достаточно быстро. Потому что это важно, особенно на… Вот на этапах сразу после выпуска игры, сразу после выпуска бета-версии. Uh, sure, I actually did. I did understand that time, but uh, <laughs> uh, we we provide a lot of the same services. I mean, a beta release means it's an introduction to an audience, um, and the audience uh, votes with their usage and with their money and. We, do, we generally will do weekly cohort analysis where every week we change features, we tweak things, and we do A-B testing, and basically spend anywhere from one month to six months in beta uh, until, we have it, until we go for a worldwide launch. And we've done that with a number of products very successfully. Um, we also will provide in office, uh, even before beta, alpha testing with live consumers where we do uh, either split screen or quad screens where we'll actually uh, provide video feedback to the developers regardless of where they live of actual consumers of that game prior to launch as well. So that when we do launch into a live production, uh, you have a pretty good feel for the mechanic and then the live production is more around the, the, the economics and the tuning of the flow, not the mechanic. By the time we launch, we want the mechanic to be good. Um, and that makes it simpler that you can decouple the mechanic from the actual business model when you're in a live beta? Um, we we pr pretty much do the same thing. Um, we really focus on the monetization of the games. 
Uh, so our producers will uh, send, send out a presentation file with all the details on what has to be fixed and uh, also a list of things that uh, they'd like to have uh, before the launch. Another um, important thing that a lot of developers <coughs> miss is they don't really prepare for the live services after the game launch. Uh, so we make sure that all of those tools are ready um, before the launch. We also do close beta testing uh, with our users uh, to make sure uh, that everything is stable uh, on the um, on the monetization front and also on the server front too. Uh, to we do a lot of stress testing on, on the builds uh, to see if it could uh, have enough users uh, uh, on the on the servers too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we too uh, something totally different. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, for us, we're a little bit more uh, web game focused, so obviously our production cycles are much smaller uh, than, the, than the big uh, free-to-play models or the premium models. Um, for us, you know, we, uh, as, as we say, we use live bullets. So when you launch uh, a web game, you're pretty much live and out there for everyone to see. Uh, we're much more interested in terms of monetization for the advertisements themselves, so we look for the uh, proper usage of when to put ads and actually uh, have the data and analytics to say, you know, this actually helps your gameplay or this improves time played, which is probably our most in important metric. Um, so we're, we're very much more focused on, in terms of the consumer experience and treating it in such a way. But again, again it's, you know, similar to these things where, you know, data is super critical, important for us, and, uh, you know, we couldn't function without it. The, the one thing I will add is that we have a number of developers that build for Windows or PC first, even before mobile. One of the downsides of mobile is the submission process is very lengthy, uh, especially on iOS. Uh, with our PC uh, production, we can do daily iterations if it's needed, if the developer can keep up and get feedback on a much faster uh, kind of feedback cycle um, and kind of speed up that beta period from being several months, of, uh, much of which is waited, waiting in the submission process. We can tighten that down to a much uh, shorter time frame and get to market and get get the product tuned much faster on the PC and then take it to iOS or, or Android. Yeah, uh, we also do a lot of testing on Android first because you could yeah. do daily uh, um, multiple submissions in the same day too. So uh, yeah, sometimes it, it becomes more handier even though you're launching on iOS first, uh, doing testing on Android. Too. Yeah, but the, if you do have the option of uh, testing on PC, that is always that's always great. Um, so some direct questions too. A lot of the, a lot of what a lot of the developers, and I assume a lot of the developers here, need money to finish their game. How do you guys? How do financial structures work? Number one, how do financial structures work? Assuming you want the game, and where does the game normally need to be for you guys to pick it up? In other words, license fee, advance against royalty. Then what type of royalty could they expect? And when do you normally have to see the game for you guys to approve it? Once again, let's assume you want the game. And I know that it'll be a range, but even if you provide a range, that would be great. It, it, it's almost an impossible question to ask. It's not because of the sensitive nature of it. It's just simply it depends on the partner. We have partners we've worked with for eight years, and the type of deal we'll strike with a partner with that we trust, that we've brought multiple games to market with, look very different than a first-time developer who we've never worked with and we don't have a history where we'll be more conservative and be more careful. So it's not that I'm evading the question, it's just that it's it, re question, it really depends on both the type of content, whether it's premium or, or free to play, uh, our confidence in the size of the market of the product, and then the developer and whether we've worked with them extensively or if it's the first time. So there is no real easy way to answer that. Kind of a general goal is that we'd like, the, if the partner needs funding, is to fund them to break even and then give them a healthy royalty so they're incented to make a great game, not just a good game. But there, there is funding available for the right game. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I said I, if we have a partner that we know and we trust, we'll fund it to what I consider a break even for the developer. And okay. that we, then we're both relying on the success of that game, not just the publisher, but both of us are relying on that for profits. And will you support the live team at break even again until the revenue catches up? Yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean there okay. is no such thing as free to play that isn't a live service. So what he was saying down there, uh, for someone in free to play, and you know, that's kind of, it's well understood for people in premium that launch and walk away. Um, you know, they need to get their arms around the fact that, you know, the, the, the effort really starts after launching the game. Okay. And there's a lot of expense there and we pay royalties some off of dollar one where no matter what the game 
costs us. Uh, they're making money that from month one to for the operations. And then as the game scales, there's additional royalties that come in. Perfect. Uh, and once again, I know this is a hard question. So, Also, where do you, it's a new developer. There's a lot of developers here who you probably haven't met before. Say it's a new developer and they submit to you. Really, for you guys to really look at the game and evaluate it, where do you want that developer to be? Where do you want that game to be before you evaluate it? What's the minimum that you, you would normally? I mean, uh, pictures are easy. If it's a developer we worked with for many years, you know, a few clever screenshots and kind of a, a thesis is enough. If it's a developer we have never worked with, we'd want a, a very a fully playable, you know, five to 30 minute uh, game build before we'd have confidence in moving forward with a new developer. Yeah, that's fair. По поводу условий, мы всегда отталкиваемся от 50 на 50, и дальше все зависит от того, на каком, на каком этапе к нам игра попадает, какое нужно обсуждать финансирование, до финансирования игры и других условий. Но 50 на 50 – хорошая стартовая точка, с которой всегда приятно начинать разговор. По поводу финансирования… Идея в том, чтобы помочь разработчику довести игру до конца, но, очевидно, желательно, чтобы у разработчика была своя кровная большая заинтересованность в том, чтобы игра зарабатывала деньги, а не просто получить авансы да, и заработать на авансах. Тем более, что во фри to play это просто не работает, поскольку после выхода игры нужно будет продолжать работать над апдейтами, развивать проект дальше. Соответственно, нам всем необходимо, чтобы игра приносила деньги, потому что если она их не будет приносить, получится, что игру нужно финансировать не только до момента разработки, но и после момента разработки, пока она не начнет зарабатывать достаточно денег. Что касается этапа, на котором мы готовы смотреть на игру, то ситуация вот такая же, как Пол описал. Если мы работаем с разработчиком давно и хорошо его знаем, это одна ситуация. Если студия может быть начинающая или без большого трек record, что называется, то нам будет более комфортно уже когда мы будем видеть играбельную версию, которая будет показывать там 15, 20, 30 минут геймплея, версию, которая бы раскрывала собственно задумку разработчика и показывала примерно конечное качество продукта. Okay, thanks. Um, we, we, we take a similar approach to um, usually it's a 50-50 deal because um, the publishing business is really a low margin business if you think about it because um, there's a lot of people uh, involved in post launch um, the producers uh, the associate producers the community managers the customer support the QA that all the publishing um, there's a lot of roles that the publisher has to take so I think um, a 50-50 is a fair uh, agreement between the developer and the publisher. Uh, we typically want to do minimum guarantees. Um, uh, so we have deals that have been up to a million dollars in, ter in terms of uh, minimum guarantees, but uh, most of the deals are sub 500K. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, if, if the deal goes over a million dollars, uh, we'll sometimes even look into equity investment into the companies. Uh, we typically want to do that after having a relationship uh, uh, of a couple of games. And um, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So you guys tap out at about a million. So don't come to you with something, but really 500,000? Yeah, uh, there, there's not a lot of uh, developers who ask for more, more yeah. than a million. And if, if, if there is, uh, they, pro they pretty much have a good reason why they are. So <laughs> we'll look at all the deals. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think that's in our comfort zone. Yeah, <laughs> it, it just so you know, in the mobile space, what we're seeing in the comfort zone seems to be 250 to 500 for mm -hmm. mid-core to hardcore. For casual games, we're seeing 50 to 100 really is the max. That's what, that's what we see when mm -hmm. we go out there. I, is that about in range with you guys? I mean, that, it, that's where I'd say it starts, and it depends on the confidence and the scope yeah. of the game. I mean, if you're making a very complex multiplayer you know, game, it's going to be a bigger budget. Uh, if you're doing something Blue Ocean that's never been done before, it's going to be a bigger budget. Yeah. So. 
But that, that's what we seem to be seeing as the sweet spot. If you're, if you're in that range, you're pretty comfortable. If you get above it, you better have a really good reason. Uh, 50, если мы говорим о премиум игре, то сейчас, наверное, это такой вот уже даже не стандарт, достаточно высокая цифра. Если мы говорим про фри to play конечно, на 50-100 тысяч э, довести игру до релиза, это, наверное, сложно, хорошую. Э, поэтому становится вдвойне важным э, наличие играбельной версии, если разработчик нам не знаком. Um, и, uh, соответственно, в принципе, можно обеспечить поддержку денежную и выше, но нужно четко понимать, четко видеть, нам четко видеть, что это за продукт и каков его потенциал. That, that's a great answer. And also, too, when I was talking about the 50, 50K, that's more for a super casual game. Um, the more complex, the, the more complex, the more mid-core we see starting to creep above a million. Mm -hmm. But when, when a developer walks in with a mobile game at that rate, it better, you better be a proven developer that's done, had a hit in the past, and it better be something special. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have, you know, for the right opportunity, we will spend quite a bit. I mean, it has to be the right opportunity, it has to be a proven development team. Yeah. Um, we have a very large project underway with a very large development team with a long 15-year track record of making hit games. And we're only funding half the game, and it's $2 million. So we do do big That's budget great. games, but we do a lot of smaller casual games as well because you don't know where the next hit will come from. But I, I think that's one of the key takeaways from that. It's a proven group that they worked with. Um, I think there's a lot of startup teams in here, or there are at least the teams that would be new to working with you guys. So one of the key things is I think we need a playable. You have to have a really, really strong playable, especially if you're asking for, for money. Dan? Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not in the, uh, the, the, the premium space uh, anymore. I mean, our focus is obviously on, on much smaller web games. Um, you know, and for us, you know, we're, we're paying for a lot of work for higher stuff, some licensing fees. You know, I think uh, our model is more about, you know, we want uh, smaller web games, but we're willing to fund, you know, 10 to 12 of these uh, in a given year. So uh, for us, that's more of the, the, the you know, going live for, uh, with, a, with a publisher, if that makes sense for you, for you guys, uh, as opposed to that. Does, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask her up? Oh, that was fast. Thank you. I'm Sasha. I have a small team of developers and my biggest pain sits right here. His name is Alex. He's my head of game design. I'm trying to work with some publisher and my team says, who the hell are they to tell us what to do? They're very jealous. They have a vision. They have a project. It's like their baby. And Alex here says, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to change my game design, whatever those people say. He doesn't care how experienced you are, how many successful projects you have. What do I do with him? What do we do when the team is jealous of publishers, when they do not accept the help you offer? Thank you. Well, you know, we're, we're always willing to take risks with people with strong beliefs. It's just that the economic risk gets shift more on the developer if they're not willing to, to take the advice that we provide. So it really depends on if you're asking for a lot of money and you're not listening, that's not a relationship that'll work out. If you're looking at a publisher for the other things a publisher brings to the table and you have your own idea and you're funding the game, you have a lot more liberties to do what you want and you take the risk. So it really depends on your risk appetite. I, I, I even think though, even if you completely fund it and you don't listen to the publisher, they're just not gonna support you. Because they're going to run, remember, most publishers are analytics driven. It doesn't matter how, what a genius they are if the market doesn't want it. The market's going to tell them really fast. It could be the best idea in the world and the market just doesn't care. So you, need to you have to listen to your publisher or don't use them. But to be fair, there's, you know, in games that you buy, there's a lot of known, I'll call it prescriptive ways to make a successful game. Free to play every time you think you have it figured out, someone else comes to market with some brand new concept that's a hit. Yeah. And so that's why I say it depends on your risk profile. If you want to take a risk, we're willing to partner with people who are smart and 
think they, they know what the next big thing is, uh, we're just less likely to put as much money at risk with that partner. I, I had someone say the best thing to me about uh, free to play. There is absolutely one constant in free to play market. What worked six months ago won't work now. That is the only constant in the free to play. It's constantly changing. Um, ну, во-первых, мы сами разработчики, мы такую позицию очень хорошо понимаем. А, с другой стороны, мы очень успешно сотрудничаем с рядом студий, весьма успешных, а, которые тоже все со своими большими эгами и мнениями о том, как надо развивать проекты. И как-то нам, в общем-то, удается находить общий язык, потому что мы не лезем в какие-то креативные решения, там, как назвать персонажа, как он должен выглядеть, условно говоря. Да? Мы подсказываем, каким образом сделать так, чтобы монетизация работала, не нарушая вашего замысла. Более того, наши продюсеры всегда открыты к диалогу. А если у вас есть какое-то сильное мнение по поводу того, как монетизация должна работать, мы всегда готовы обсудить и э, что-то новое попробовать. Но, естественно, там, у вас как руководителя студии да, должно быть, э, должна быть возможность некоего вето да, или финального решения, что либо мы делаем так, либо мы делаем так. И здесь важно налаженное взаимодействие все-таки с руководством студии. Эм, ну и, конечно, сложнее действительно. Во вообще это очень утомительно, если честно, когда идет борьба между разработчиком и издателем по маркетинговым материалам, или это, это отнимает очень много времени и обычно больше вредит. То есть мы стараемся найти какой-то компромисс. И, конечно, действительно, вот, как Пол сказал, сложно э, работать со студией, которая, с одной стороны, хочет много денег, а с другой стороны, не хочет слушать. Это, пожалуй, самая сложная и неприятная комбинация, которая возможна. Yeah, I think the developer and publisher relationship is uh, a lot like a marriage in some ways too. And uh, you have to have, uh, have a lot of respect and also a willingness to change. And um, especially it's not something that you're just going to produce a baby and then you're going to get divorced. It, you're going to have to live with them forever and you're going to have to raise that baby and you'll, you'll, have, you'll, you'll get into fights. You're totally <laughs> ruining this for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, yeah, um, I, um, we, we fight a lot with the, with the developers and um, I think if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing a service, you, you can't expect the, Uh, the game to be the same. Like uh, all the games that we run as a service is totally a different game today uh, compared to where it was a year a year yeah. ago. Yeah. yeah, I think um, you know it's tough. You're going to have creative people uh, who are extremely passionate about uh, what they believe is going to do well. Um, you also have publishers. You know, and again, our experience is based off of analytics. It's based off you know almost decades now of, of monetization experience. So, you know, if anything, uh, you know, as I tell my producers, you know, make mistakes and make them quick and don't make them again. So we, we highly encourage, you know, to try new stuff because that's the only way you're really going to have a super breakout hit. Um, but at the end of the day, I also remind them if you really, really screw up, I'm going to remind you for the rest of your life. So, you know, be cognizant of that. Um, and again, this is, this is an ongoing process. So there's multiple points, you know, from alpha to concept to beta to second beta, third beta, where you're getting tons of data. And at some point, you know, if your team isn't listening to that, you really have to kind of you know, evaluate your team in terms of, of you know, is this the right fit? Because the publisher will be doing the same because they don't want to waste their time. You know, they want to uh, have successful studios. They want to have successful relationships. You know, um, I'm not going to say it's a marriage because I'm a fair commitment as it is. So. Um, But I think it's super important for both sides to be willing to to commit to that, and part of that's by listening. So, thank you. Yeah, and, and Paul brought up a really good point too. I mean, the reason these guys are here is to find that new thing. That's why I mean, probably everyone on this panel isn't here to see. Oh, it's like Angry Birds. Oh, it's like Clash of Kinds. No one's here to find that game. They're here to find the new and innovative game. But that said, they know the market, and you know, it could it. Who said about just simply monetizing, like helping on monet, monet, when you guys said something about just helping on monetization, there are certain things that everything is a guess, it is a service, the game's going to keep on evolving. We all agree with that. But there's certain things that they know that can shorten that cycle down. 
you know, normally this works, this doesn't. And, you know, but sometimes what doesn't work works for a different game. It's just a balance, I think, of listening to the publisher. Um, does anyone else have a question? I have one. So I want to shift the conversation away from what happens before launch to what happens after launch because that's where I get skeptical actually about the developer-publisher relationship. And specifically, when you're dealing with a game service, you're dealing with uh, a very tightly coupled loop between marketing and product development. So you've got lots of engagement marketing that's going out to your existing community. You've got lots of game updates that are coming out and content updates coming out and keeping those, those, that, communi that outbound communication to your users in sync with what's going on in your game is really hard, even in one organization. So can you guys talk a little bit about how you connect your uh, marketing efforts and your community development efforts with what's happening on a game across all of the different games that you publish? Do you want to start um, отличный вопрос. Uh, у нас есть успешный опыт uh, подобной совместной работы с ребятами из Майтона uh, по проекту The Secret Society. Uh, мы достаточно успешно работаем вместе, выпуская ежемесячные апдейты. При этом каждый апдейт это по сути полноценный цикл разработки. Это как выпускать по игре в месяц. То есть нужно придумать какой новый контент, какая новая функциональность идет в этот апдейт. Нужно ее разработать, создать, все это собрать, протестировать на совместимость с предыдущими версиями, локализовать. Там огромный объем работы и главное, он очень э, компактен во времени. Нужно делать итерации быстро. Однако это возможно и вот возвращаясь к предыдущему вопросу, самое главное в это время не терять времени на какую-то борьбу э, между издателем и разработчиком. Необходима слаженная работа. Поэтому отношения хорошие между разработчиком и издателем выходят на первый план. Мы все больше смотрим на то, насколько получается вот, эффективно сотрудничать с разработчиком. Если сотрудничество с разработчиком во время разработки а, буксует из-за каких-то там конфликтов и вопросов, соответственно, делается вывод, что совместно эффективно работать по развитию игры, скорее всего, не получится. И мы просто не можем себе позволить тратить огромное количество времени на выяснение каких-то вопросов в процессе этой работы. Um, собственно, вот. Um, I mean, when you launch a game, uh, the more eyes that are on the data coming in, the better. And we try and be completely transparent with as new customers come in and the performance and we have a standard set of metrics and we allow the game developer to access them in real time. Um, we can provide a dashboard. We have our own analysts interpreting what's going on, but we also look to the developer to develop that expertise over time to understand their own game and their own metrics. And I think that's a good combination when you have two or more perspectives on the same set of data and coming to conclusions on what is working and what is not. Each game has its own strengths and weaknesses and really focusing on that. Uh, with both the developer hat on and with as well as the business and marketing hat on is, is a good combination. One, one thing that we think we do a little bit differently is uh, on the marketing budget, we actually deduct it from the net revenue and then we split the net revenue uh, with the developer. So uh, marketing doesn't come out of only our part pocket, uh, it comes out uh, from the developer's pocket together. Of course, um, there, we always get approval from the developer if we, uh, if we can spend it or not. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a joint process in the, in the decision making. And we've seen a lot of cases where publishers will uh, have a fixed marketing budget and in, once they run out of it, they stop pushing it and uh, we didn't want to run into those uh, steps. Uh, so we actually we, we make it an ongoing process even on the marketing budget. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of good points that are brought up here. I think, you know, for you as the developer, the, I think the most important thing is when you're looking for a publisher or when you're signing up with a publisher is to um, ask about kind of that, you know, deployment roadmap. Um, both you, the publisher, and the developer should actually have a strategy if you're, especially in the free-to-play market, of saying, yes, we're launching it, but then what's the actual support roadmap for that six months down the road. So you as an independent developer saying how much content are you going to be supplying 
and when, and then the publisher should be looking at in terms of uh, their marketing plan. So, I mean, both of you guys should be looking at this as a service, which I think, you know, you're starting to see a lot of those as the publishers, but I think also the indies need to start, you know, taking that into accountability before you sign up with anything, saying, recognizing that the launch is only the middle point of your game and kind of saying, well, you have to think about the beginning, the middle, and the end uh, as a developer and a publisher. По поводу маркетинга хотел добавить, что после того, как игра выходит, и мы начинаем видеть аналитику, и разработчик, естественно, ее тоже видит, мы обычно обсуждаем с разработчиком определенные KPI, какие-то ключевые параметры монетизации, которые должны быть достигнуты на органическом трафике, который приходит из нашей собственной обменной сети. И когда достигаются эти параметры, мы подключаем, соответственно, платную рекламу и происходит масштабирование продаж. Соответственно, основной фокус после релиза идет на то, чтобы достичь вот этих ключевых показателей, которые мы с разработчиком согласовываем. Потому что если показатели достигнуты, то дальше игру можно масштабировать и наращивать продажи очень эффективно. Если эти ключевые параметры не достигнуты, игра тоже может быть неплохим бизнесом, но, скажем так, Апсайд для разработчика будет значительно ниже в таком случае. So we kind of got ahead of ourselves on the rest of the questions here. Does anyone else have a question, or does anyone have a particular product? Меня зовут Алексей. Вопрос такой: чтобы мне как разработчику лучше понять, что делать, ответьте на такой вопрос. Какой процент от игр, которые вы берете на текущий момент, составляют полностью готовые игры, играбельные версии, как вот Влад сказал, и игры на уровне идеи, если можно, просто цифры. Спасибо. На уровне идей очень мало. Ну там, проценты какие-то, наверное. И во всех случаях это были... Скажем так, это, уров... это игры на уровне идеи, но базирующиеся на предыдущих успешных продуктах и со студией, с которой мы совместно много денег заработали. А большая часть, ну, практически подавляющая, это, как правило, игры, подписанные на этапе наличия играбельной демо-версии. Что касается игр законченных, ну, были такие несколько, да, в основном премиум. Но если мы говорим про free-to-play, если мы говорим даже сейчас про премиум, то, как правило, объем доработок достаточно большой, с одной стороны. Но с другой стороны, мы не подписывать… Ну, то есть нам даже лучше подписывать не на финальном этапе, когда мы все еще можем вносить изменения в игру, потому что они, скорее всего, понадобятся. Поэтому лучший вариант – это начинать показывать игру, когда есть first playable. With, uh... With our existing developers that we work with for a number of years, I would say the majority of games that we sign with them are at the design concept where there is no playable. Um, with a developer we haven't worked with before, 0% uh, are at the design phase. It has to be at a playable phase. Um, the, the developers, some of the developers we've been working with as long as seven, eight years, and we have a lot of uh, trust and understanding and their ability to pull off a game based on a design doc alone and we'll sign games at that level. Um, but if we've never worked with a developer, uh, paper is easy to put together, fun games are hard. So we'd want to see a, a full playable. Um, I th yeah, it's pretty, pretty much similar um, for our existing partners or uh, partners uh, who have a good track record. Uh, we could, we're pretty comfortable signing just with the design document. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to new new developers, it's pretty much uh, a playable that that we need. But um, there's a lot of competition going on between the publishers these days. So um, as a publisher, we're feeling more pressure to sign in earlier stages. And I think as a developer, you have plenty of options uh, out in the market. So building up to the playable wouldn't be a big risk. Uh, uh, for you is what I would say uh, too. Um, there are also some deals where we just look at the people, and yeah. without even without a design document, we would um, fund. Uh, fund. Uh, it would be more like a seed investment uh, for those type of companies. Uh, but yeah, I think it's pretty much similar. 
Dan? Yeah, pretty much what everyone at Upsayer said. Yeah, I can't remember. We do maybe a mobile deal every couple of weeks. I can't remember the last time we did one with a new company that was on a piece of paper. I, I can't. <laughs> I mean, we, we have, we, we, well, if it's a proven group, sometimes there is a proven group, and you meet the people, and they just say, I just want to do your next game. So that does happen sometimes, but you have to have made games that have done really, really well. If you're a startup group that's never shipped a game, you really have to have a playable. Hi, um, my name is uh, Shannon Gallagher, and I'm an intellectual property attorney. I wanted to ask the panel if you could tell me, I've worked with different developers in the past, and they bring me things, and they're looking for trademark protection, or someone else is looking at what they've been doing, and there's intellectual property problems. So when, when in the development do you advise that the developers or that you look at the IP and uh, trademark issues? I mean, I mean, as a publisher, we take on that liability. Uh, our contracts do make the developer does indemnify us, but it, most developers don't have the backing to back up that indemnity. Um, and so we do take on that responsibility. We're, we live in the US, which is a fairly litigious society. Um, that said, the game space, uh, there's not that many examples of successful, uh, you know, definitely not patent uh, enforcement. On the trademark side, there's, that's a pretty much more easy uh, search to do, and we do often do that, whether it's the title of the game or other kind of copyrighted uh, art forms. Um, but it's really in the game space, you know, every game is a derivative of another game, and so from the patent side, we don't worry about it that much. We do worry about it on a on infringing on a title or infringing on a, on a piece of art, that answers your question. We take on that responsibility, but uh, we haven't had a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues with it in the past. Uh, really quickly, are you assuming the publisher owns the intellectual property or the developer? Uh, I'll, I'll take this in English then. Uh, we, we sort of rely on our experience with um, you know, with games, we assume that we have seen a lot of games. So when producers look at the game that is submitted, we can quite well understand if there's any risks, you know, um, any similarities to the known products. Uh, we do the uh, trademark checks, of course, to avoid, you know, releasing a game with a name that infringes on someone's uh, trademark. We actually also, uh, th the standard contract, of course, indemnifies us as a publisher, but um, as Paul mentioned, usually developers don't have the, the resources to do that, so we have to be involved in any disputes, and we actually had some recently, and uh, basically we were quite proactive in discussing it with the developer and the other party and uh, reaching a, a settlement which worked for all the parties involved. So we are, um, I mean, definitely developers, especially out of Eastern Europe, they need this sort of advice and protection, and that's what we do provide to them. Um, yep. uh, we typically apply for the trademark after the game name is decided. Um, so, uh, yeah, we trademark pretty much all of our games uh, these days. Uh, in the past, there were cases where we didn't. Um, Yeah, I mean, it's uh, from a development point of view, I would do it uh, as soon as you come up with a name, just because it's, uh, I've done enough of these games over the years where, you know, uh, you have a concept, you love the title, you're in love with the title, you're in love with the character, you create it all of a sudden, uh, you know, Disney created this, you know, 50 years ago, and you're just like, damn it. <laughs> um, you, you know, and, and, and then it kind of, it can actually mess up your entire development cycle. So I, I think, you know, you can always start uh, at the very beginning when you're in design phase, which I kind of recommend just to do the, at least the research to understand, uh, you know, at least what kind of challenges you might run into, even from a search or even from a, something that might be too similar to it. Um, because what, the last thing you want to do is work with a, a publisher, launch your game, and then have a nice big fat email from some, you know, lawyer group uh, letting you know that you have a cease and desist and all kinds of fun stuff. And so, yeah, we're indemnified, but it, it, it ruins your game. You know, you, you can launch this game and under this title 
and if you all of a sudden after a week you have to take it down because of the name, you know, I've seen that just kill studios completely. So, okay. uh, there was another question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have one question concerning the free to play or premium casual. Uh, oh, hello. Okay, I have one question um, concerning free to play or premium content because I am the new developer and I'm thinking what to do next. So I think maybe it's a good question for because uh, you are here. And we all, in previously uh, a lecture, we, uh, we heard that um, it's free to play is something that will happen in future. That's a good model. I uh, saw the poll lecture. It was really good and showed that the numbers are good and correct. But uh, what I'm concerned as a developer is the relationship between costs and income for free-to-play games. Because we saw that um, your game found and uh, Big Fish Casino, uh, you have to spend a lot of money for every day, every month, to, to, for that game to be a living game. So I am just quest my question is, uh, free-to-play game, are they a good choice for the new development studio? Thank you. Well, it depends on if you want to have a small chance or no chance of being successful. Um, we're, we are the largest publisher of premium games in the world, and we don't need more developers. Uh, if you were to develop a game for premium and launch it, uh, it would be very difficult for you to earn any money, earn a positive return on the effort to build that game today. Uh, the world has changed. Free to play, unfortunately as well, is a hit-driven industry. Um, but better to partner someone and have a chance at a hit than not have any chance of a viable return at all. And so when you, when you, if you're an independent developer, you should make sure you resource yourself to miss a few times. If you're betting everything on one title, that's extremely risky. Um, like I said, it is a hit-driven industry, and last time I checked, I said this in my keynote, there's only 10 games in the top 10, uh, and that'll never change. And so, it's a hard question to answer. It's, you know, five years ago, I'd have a very different answer. There was a huge amount of room for small developers to build indie developers or independent developers or just casual game developers to build a premium title and have a decent return. It's not going to be a hit. It's not going to make you millions of dollars off of one title, but you'd have a nice return on that. With free-to-play, it's much more of a hits-driven industry, and the risks are greater, but so are the rewards. Um, you don't, I can't think of a casual premium game that has made as much in its lifetime as Candy Crush does in a week. And so free to play is exciting because the opportunity is much bigger, but it is riskier. And so it's something you as a developer need to kind of wrap your arms around and say, what is your risk profile and do you have the resources for a few misses? Uh, yeah, и тяжело начинать в такой ситуации, какая сейчас на рынке, потому что если что-то делаешь, неважно, премиум или free to play, важно делать э, действительно очень хороший продукт и выделяться качеством. И надо действительно выбрать, что для вас, в зависимости от того, какая у вас там структура расходов и так далее, э, что вам интереснее, э, больше риска и больше возможностей, или меньше риска, и меньше возможности заработать. Обычно начинающие студии имеет смысл, наверное, первый продукт делать такой более консервативный. В этом смысле высокого качества премиум игра, наверное, хороший вариант. А с другой стороны, все зависит от коллектива, от его сильных, слабых сторон. Если вы все ветераны индустрии с хорошими сложными списками, может быть, имеет смысл на фри ту плей замахнуться. Free-to-play рынок, он действительно хит-дривен, но я вижу, что для многих разработчиков, в принципе, вот у нас даже уже вырисовываются в портфолио free-to-play игры, которые, с одной стороны, явно не стали хитами и звездами и не зарабатывают огромных денег, с другой стороны, они, тем не менее, деньги зарабатывают и достаточны для поддержания, скажем так, небольшой студии, расположенной в Восточной Европе. Соответственно, это дает возможность учиться делать итерации и думать над следующим проектом. We have, we have one more minute. If you want to jump in. 
Um, yeah, we only do free to play. Uh, we don't look at premium. Uh, we only work with company nowadays. We only work with companies that have sizable teams too. Um, so if uh, if you're an indie developer, uh, I think that you should look for other routes. Um, and but if you're looking for a publisher, I think we have a bigger goal that we want to achieve together. And I think we probably want you to have a team of at least five people. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just know that really if you have a pay-to-play game, the only market that still likes it is South America. Uh, a lot of publishers won't even look at a pay-to-play game. But you said it best, make the game you want to make. Don't build a business model, build a game. And lo and behold, if it's a great game, people will find it. And you might start with lower, lower cost games for like Spiel where the, the risks are lower, where you can afford to fail and learn uh, before you build a, a big bet. That's smart. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, we need to wrap. Are, can you guys be available for questions out in the hallway? Because we have to get out of this room. Sure. Sure. Okay, guys, they'll be out in the hallway. We can't stay in this room. The next uh, concert needs to come in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, publishers. Thank you, Jeff.